So, um, thanks, Richard. And uh, I should say I have a, a rather lengthy PowerPoint, so if you are interested after my presentation, you could uh, uh, read more, but I will only use, in the interest of time, uh, two slides from the uh, presentation. I must say, um, when looking at the conference program, that WIDA developed uh, for us, one clearly gets another um, uh, impression of the uh, fact that um, uh, uh, under global challenges are multiplying, global challenges are worsening, and apparently at present we are not very good at really addressing and dealing effectively with global challenges. So this idea came to me some time ago, and I decided to um, do something which was very painful in many ways, uh, to look at the literature that has been published since the 1970s using uh, the term international public good, global public good, transnational public good, whatever, because most of the global challenges we are uh, facing and also addressing here at the conference do have properties of a public good and can be called a global public good. So when I was doing this literature uh, uh, survey, uh, I noticed something, uh, and that is that uh, in large measure, most of us, uh, we have um, not yet come around to updating our concepts and our theories. We are using theories that were developed in the 50s, 60s, and whatnot, in order to look at today's realities, and I think to wake you up uh, completely, that one can say that academic failure in a large measure justifies, hides, even excuses state failure, failure in the provisioning of uh, global public goods. And of course, state failure again creates room for market failure. But at the uh, beginning of the chain of all these failures is in large measure academic failure that we look with old analytical lenses at today's realities and then jump to um, conclusions in terms of institutional change and so on. So I, there, one could say a lot about these failures, but uh, I will only give four examples of issue areas where we would need to rethink, priorities to rethink. And once you um, uh, see the need for rethinking, immediately one also sees, uh, sees new ways of possible institutional reform that could probably make a difference in uh, providing public goods and doing it more effectively and efficiently, equitably, so that we all come uh, uh, on board. Priority area number one is uh, we are totally confused uh, when it comes to the term global. I did a Google search and you find that global is being used as meaning international or transnational or worldwide or, or something. But uh, even uh, uh, most scholars who use the term global link it to international level. And as a result, uh, we have today a continuation of a social science organization and related studies where Public economists look down into the country. International economists look out. International relations people look beyond the national borders. Then many uh, uh, people just look at a partial aspect of what is indeed a, a, a phenomenon that is global in the sense that it is worldwide, transnational, even cutting across generations reaching into countries, reaching out of countries. This globality of our challenges has not yet been captured in our analytical frameworks and in our theories. Here you see the spaghetti bowl of uh, uh, what it all would be implied in the provisioning of a global public good that follows a summation pass, and most global public goods follow such a summation pass. So as scholars, we pick here a corner and talk then about interactions among states in a global public good area, but we really don't talk about the governance and the requi governance requirements of the good. We talk about relations between states 
or we talk about what is happening at the national level, uh, like uh, Eleanor Ostrom does in relation to a global public good, or we talk about the private sector in relation to a global public good. But we never look at, in an integrated systematic manner, at the overall provision path of the global uh, public good in question. And therefore, you also find that in the literature, somehow it's very rare to find a hard-nosed discussion on subsidiarity, what really has to be done at the international level, let's say at the UN level, because when you really then go to the more uh, natural science uh, uh, or technical literature on global public goods, you find that more than 90% of what is required to be done actually has to be done nationally. Uh, and, uh, but uh, many scholars say, ah, global public good, that means we have to do something more at the international level. No, not necessarily. So uh, once you recognize the need for a, a definition of global in the sense of comprehensive, going from the national local level to the international and back down again, then one, uh, of course, um, would come to the first institutional implications. In our governance systems, it's still rare to have a unit at the international level or national level really dealing with global challenges in this global uh, 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 framework. Yeah, we have global affairs, but that is also a new type of international relations, uh, often or a tiny unit of global health in a ministry of health, but there are two people, and uh, health in the main is still uh, looked at nationally. So my suggestion is that maybe we have to include in governance systems nationally and internationally, uh, uh, global issue management as a new organizational criterion and uh, function. And then in order to facilitate this global issue analysis and <coughs> management, it would be of course good for various uh, global public goods to do integrated comprehensive provision pass analysis. This, at least in a rough way, must not be like the IPCC reports uh, that are so detailed and very excellent, but one can also do it in a more rough way. And then since each and every good follows quite a unique provision path, would we not uh, be well advised and should we not explore whether we should have global issue managers or facilitators create networks of uh, global issue managers at the national and international level and then see whether we all do just one thing and ignore other parts of the provision of the good the, such a facilitator could keep an eye on where things are happening, where uh, shortfalls occur. So um, all of this we are in large measure lacking at present, but you also see the grass sprouting. Some changes are coming up. You know, the UN um, Secretary General has special issue representatives. You, know, you have uh, more and more global reports. So the beginnings are there. And basically, one would have to um, uh, facilitate the breakthrough by institutionalizing global issue management in governance systems nationally and internationally. My second example is how to address uh, the uh, 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 state and market failure that occurs in the presence of global public goods. And I come back to our academic failure at the end. Uh, because, yeah, most scholars recognize that um, states, when they appear internationally, like in the UN or in any other multilateral uh, forum, they are individual, particular actors. And just like none of you has ever probably paid for a um, traffic light or street light out of your own money, uh, so the states are all, yeah, for leaving no one behind, you know, as the... Uh, uh, Agenda 2030 uh, tells us, but when it comes to putting uh, uh, the money where the mouse is, then we lean back and um, uh, something may happen or uh, may not happen. So many scholars uh, looking at this behavior uh, of states say, ah, yeah, I have had a course uh, way back in public economics and public good theory, and of course read the textbooks which all say when you have a public good, you know, 
being rational actors, an assumption uh, that is also increasingly queried but still maintained in most uh, studies. A rational actor would free ride on a public good. Well, one uh, that applied nationally because, after all, the state had co coercive power, could tax and then provide the state uh, the good nevertheless in uh, many cases. But internationally, uh, we have only a collection of states without coercive uh, uh, powers. So uh, many of my colleagues in the global public good arena then say, hmm, where do we get someone with coercive powers? And the conclusion is, oh yeah, we have uh, hegemon or uh, uh, the EU and the US together. They can step forward and provide the good and then either come out with tiny carrots to entice people to come along or trade sanctions, sticks and so on. But as a result, you have a, a huge array of literature saying, oh, it, it, Adequate global public goods provision needs, uh, because of free riding, needs a leadership, and we are stabilizing and continuing to justify hegemonic power and so on. So my question is, uh, is free riding really the problem? Because when you then go in detail to what is happening in various international negotiations, you see that states, de uh, developing countries in particular, are leaning back because they try to avoid uh, getting settled with top-down power politics, with advice that is ill-fitting for their country. So it's not free riding. It's trying to uh, avoid um, getting settled with um, the ill effects uh, of power politics. Or in the case of China and other newly emerging markets, they say we can also speak for ourselves. We have other preferences. We want to bring them in. But we don't see that we have a voice. A voice so therefore, they renege, step back, and do their uh, own stuff. So uh, it is uh, hasty and wrong to say that uh, the reluctance of state to, to act in the presence of global public goods is always free riding and that we need a leader uh, uh, and someone who pushes uh, the other states into uh, coming along in issue areas that interests the hegemon or the, uh, the um, uh, other powerful states because who can step forward? You need money if you want to bribe someone or pay carrots or come with sticks, you need huge markets or uh, a lot of money. The other question related to it is we have to think through uh, what international cooperation, what type of activities these are. Because uh, I can observe in these international negotiations that a lot of so-called international cooperation is really an exchange or a trade activity, a quid pro quo political uh, exchanges or you reduce CO2 and I pay you uh, for it. So could it be that we would be much better advised to look at um, international cooperation as a political market and then conclude that this political market at present has all the problems that we don't like anymore in the economic markets. There is the tired but still present hegemon, which uh, resembles a monopole uh, uh, of power. If you put the EU together with the US, we have an oligopole. You know, there are information asymmetries and everything uh, makes international, uh, this inter uh, international political markets fail that we know also from the economic markets. So would it not be better to look at international negotiations, at least in large measure also, through the lens of markets and say, is this market embedded? Have we really an institutional framework for the political market? Or is arm twisting, usury, just uh, all kinds of things that we don't tolerate in economic markets are still permissible in the political markets? So um, let me show you one more slide, because uh, I think empirically one could also argue that if a global public good is very public in consumption, like uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, international financial regulation, you know, 
is very public in consumption when a financial crisis occurs because the regulation was in, uh, not uh, very, very good, then the whole world, as we heard in the morning and uh, uh, before, is uh, suffering potentially. Be, they have to consume it, but they are not consuming positive utility, but disutility. However, then we also say that many more and more countries have to contribute to strengthening, like yes, Basel III, or implement Basel III, strengthening financial regulation. But why would they do it if they don't have a say? Look, think of this little cozy club, the Financial Stability Board. You know, it's, it's uh, very much influenced, a few regulators influenced heavily by the industry. So you have very, great uh, strong publicness in consumption, strong publicness in provision, but very deficient publicness in decision making. And then we shouldn't be surprised that as a result, we find that there is a very uneven distribution of publicness in utility. So actually, when you think of international financial regulation, uh, the inner dotted circle applies. And what would be interesting for follow-up research is to say, does the assumption underlying this graph actually hold that when you have strong publicness in consumption, strong publicness in provision, that it would be advisable to also have a strong publicness in decision-making so that all concerned stakeholders and parties can argue for how they want this uh, regulation to be organized so that publicness of utility results. My third point, quickly, uh, is a, 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 a concept that uh, I call systemic integrity requirements of global public goods. Because intriguing is to uh, look at the hundred and something uh, indicators that rank national state behavior in terms of what states do for the environment or for this or for that uh, uh, um, other global public good. But we always rank those who move slowly on these issues among themselves. So even though Sweden often comes out <laughs> as number one, still they don't do enough for the atmosphere in terms of what the atmosphere requires. Yeah, I see the colors coming towards me. So uh, I, I, my suggestion is, uh, it's fine that, that, uh, that some of us go faster than other countries, but we have to ask what does the ocean actually require in terms of change so that acidic, acidification is being stopped? What does the atmosphere require? For the atmosphere, IPCC, thanks to them, we know quite a lot what uh, the atmosphere requires, but we could also know what financial stability requires, what it would be required in order to address global inequity or so. So today, uh, we, uh, these things, yeah, we know them, but what we go by are states' interests. And therefore, the following institutional recommendation, what we are really lacking is probably only one more institution, maybe in, under the umbrella of the UN, and that would be an independent, small, global stewardship council let's say 15 people or so, independent personalities, where one of them would be the representative of the atmosphere, Mr. or Mrs. Atmosphere, the other one, Mr. or Mrs. Ocean, the other one, global equity, the other one, global disease control, and the states could, because they're also a system, no? they could uh, probably uh, form three groups and also have three seats at the table. But this body, could then uh, 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 nudge states into closing the gap between the systemic integrity requirements and what they would be doing if they are only guided by uh, uh, state interests. So I think that uh, is a critically uh, missing um, element in our current institutional framework. Now, my fourth uh, point is, Global public goods theory needs a lot of updating, as you can gather from these few uh, hasty remarks here. But of course, it's only part of global public policy, finance, economics, whatever you want to call it. 
And uh, uh, some people have started asking what questions would uh, um, we have to address in order to move towards global public finance or global public economics. I refer in the presentation to some work by Tony Atkinson and um, uh, Sandmo. Um, but uh, uh, all I want to say here to save time is that um, uh, a lot of rethinking uh, is required in order to see how to shape uh, multilateralism and global governance uh, differently. At the very end, Richard, before I get the zero from you, um, let me say, <laughs> let me say that, um, of course, I have said the state fails here, the state fails in this respect, and the state fails in that respect. So, but most of the changes states would have to promote and decide. So what would it take to uh, get the state, why is the state not acting more proactively and um, uh, implementing some of the very feasible changes I propose? I think that today we have a state with, um, uh, 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 whose hands are tied because of the dependence primarily on financial actors and financial markets and other big market actors too. So we have to, I think, a priority before you think about what is possible in terms of global governance, we really have to tackle what uh, Martin Wolf calls the Siamese relationship between financial markets and, um, and, and the state and have to find ways of uh, enabling the state again to uh, actually have a regulatory role, to have a policy shaping role, which they don't have at present. So I find without making this change, we will go on meeting, 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 which is fine because many of us are friends. Uh, but I think we need more honesty in our discussions and pinpoint the real problems. And maybe we can also have a fine time of uh, discussing today or tomorrow uh, a favorite uh, topic of mine, helicopter money, because I think that could really make a difference if states uh, were to get from central banks a little helping hand in uh, that respect to free themselves from the dependence on financial markets. So here's the uh, good research agenda. Wider can re-invite us to um, mm. <laughs> discuss our studies on that. And thanks for your attention. Thank you.